Again, on um, behalf of the organizing committee for the PAC RIM International Conference on Disabilities, I'm so pleased to welcome you all here for a discussion about advanced biomechanical rehabilitation, a home-based and family-centered treatment of cerebral palsy and children with brain injuries. Take it away. Thanks. Thank you very much. You know, at this time of the day, to get anyone on Monday, it's always an honor. Uh, I guess we, meet, we get to proceed with some openings, and uh, I'll first do a brief introduction, and then we'll, we'll <coughs> move on. So actually, today is going to be quite an extended coverage, and I'll try to keep myself to the slides as the means to keep me centered. Well, first of all, you know, we are in 2011, right? It's 21st century, and suppose that, as we all expected at the end of 20th century, it will be full of breakthroughs, and especially in a field like cerebral palsy, you know, the thing is that the expectations and the normal angle that everyone would think of is that the major breakthrough, if one would ask you about what should it be, most likely the answer would be something in the area of a fix uh, for a brain injury which would come up with a great fanfare. But if you look at any history of science, you would see that in most of the fields, the interesting breakthroughs, they usually arrive unannounced and they come from the very unexpected end. So with this positive outlook, I would try to bring your attention to this point. So fascia and the connective tissue, that's the, been the Cinderella story of the 21st century in the medical field. And it kind of been, if you look at the papers, you would see that the number of publications have been growing steadily. And uh, there have been major conferences, there have been major, like, interest and so on, and uh, it's kind of growing expon exponentially recently. But unfortunately, it seems that in their field of cerebral palsy, <coughs> that kind of hasn't caught up yet. Because the major things that come in this sort of Cinderella story are two big points. So basically, the connective tissue have been, due to the recent research, elevated the connective tissue from familiar passive envelope status to active one, and it starts shifting the emphasis from the muscles, or muscular contractile tissue and the force generation focus, to the force transfer focus, which is the connective tissue and the myofascial links. And the thing is that in so far in cerebral palsy field, there has been little to no attention really paid to this connective tissue factors and breakthroughs. Partially due to the fact that the focus on the brain injury and the neurological emphasis, which the entire field receives, pretty much caused that the connective tissue and this fascia revolution so far remain largely unnoticed. And if you just as a simple confirmation of this, it's uh, the fact that until today, most of the cerebral palsy therapies, they still operate from this, what I dare to say, simplified neuromuscular paradigm. And obviously, it might sound a little bit ambitious, but I hope that as we move on, it will be clear. So, but it seems like a double miss, an unfortunate thing, because on the one hand, cerebral palsy, if we dissociate it from, or like, put it separately from the actual issue of the brain injury as a one-off event, at the end of the day, cerebral palsy is a musculoskeletal disorder. So it's a disorder of posture and <coughs> movement. So therefore, this expanded and uh, like advanced understanding of connective tissue factors and fascia role in it definitely should be of benefit for, this, uh, for the cerebral palsy population. And as to reinforce it even further, the connective tissue perspective actually matters most for the weakest part of the spectrum in the musculoskeletal disorders where the cerebral palsy definitely begins to, or definitely belongs to. 
So, and actually, whenever I communicate to parents and when, you know, trying to bring in the focus on, like, weaknesses, because everyone, like, familiarly looks at the CP from the perspective of the fight against, right? The fight against the contractures, fight against the spasticity, or, like, fight against the factors which are appearing to be excessively strong. I always bring up this simple test. See, imagine there is a stool, whatever, the wooden, the plastic, whatever, in the middle of the room. You bring the child in, place it on the, t on the stool, and walk out. So if that is possible, then probably the connective tissue perspective, you can kind of put it relatively aside and sort of stick to a to an older paradigm. But if that's not possible, which is definitely the case for the GMFCS, let's say, probably even starting from three and going further to four and five, well, I believe that there is a lot to gain from the perspective of the connective tissue. So that's pretty much the subject of today's talk. We're going to try to transfer this sort of knowledge and the research that has been taking place in their fascia and connective tissue field over the last, especially, let's say, 10, maybe even more, like five years, and kind of show the applications of how it works for the cerebral palsy field. And the brief review is quite straightforward. So we will first review the expanding, the expanded understanding of connective tissue role in posture and movement. That's the part which is going to be done by Mark and, you know, significant detail, detail to the scientific nuances. And then we'll also highlight the relevance and the importance of this expanded connective tissue understanding for cerebral palsy therapies. And actually it will allow us to formulate this uh, divide or this sort of differentiation that I put at the very beginning of this talk, which now sounds as lavish versus thrifty rehabilitation approaches and all like therapies for cerebral palsy. And then we'll illustrate the use of transanatomical analytics for musculoskeletal assessment of children with cerebral palsy. We have a nice young man here who is going to help us with this. So and we'll do the sample evaluation of how does that relate to arm function, sitting, mobility of lower extremities, and also kind of look at this perspective on transanatomical interpretation of spasticity and actually transanatomical interpretation of rigidity. Now, the quick intro to the very beginning that I want to make is this simple fact that with the focus on brain injury and the whole like neurological emphasis, actually what happens if you really sort of step back and think of the existing therapies, they focus on addressing the structures which are happen to be the most expensive musculoskeletal structures or the most expensive elements of the musculoskeletal system. If you think about the skeletal muscles, the voluntary muscles, from the perspective of metabolic cost of running them, from the perspective of catabolism, from the perspective of like sheer, say, brain power that needed to coordinate all this stuff, it's enormous. I mean, it's important to understand, it's Kind of, we tend to forget with especially current preoccupation and current sort of even like basic media, muscles, 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 but muscles are super expensive stuff. It's, you know, they cost an arm and a leg. It's like those gas gazlers, you know. So they are far from the green movers and uh, we have to remember this. And to a certain extent, it actually looks like a bit of a paradox when especially a severe child with cerebral palsy who is profoundly depleted on all sort of resources, whether you take the original brain injury and his whatever, brain processing capacity, the metabolism level, the ability to catabolize and so on. But all these resources, they are very low. And then we actually hit this particular person with the intensive demands on the muscles and on the intensive demands on the central nervous system, which in turn being the most expensive structures. And if, and if you look at sort of things like gait analysis, 
you know, the oxygen consumption and so on in a CP channel, it's like four or five times greater than it is in a healthy individual. You think about how many times a parent would say to a child, oh, I mean, he's lazy. You know, he can do this, but ah, he just doesn't want to do it today. So in this perspective, is actually until this set of breakthroughs in the connective tissue department, that was pretty much the only framework that one could have operated from, because there was nothing else. And that's pretty much the fact that if we look at, say, top 10, oh, arbitrary, right? Top 10 of CP therapies today, and just run a simple test, Bolot, Doman, Medic, Voita, whatever. I mean, you can add anything that you like. And in none of those top 10, you're going to meet there any emphasis on connective tissue, on its active role. And effectively, they will be all revolving around the attempts to address the muscles and somehow to stimulate the brain, namely the expansive structures. So what we are talking today and what we will be looking in this, or what we'll try to introduce today, is more the focus on the connective tissue, and Mark is going to talk about this kind of extended understanding and the kind of the whole bridging of the different uh, well, validity of this connective tissue point to the CP in a greater detail. But the main emphasis here is just to understand that connective tissue is now being seen as the valid participant active force transmitter and throughout the entire body and effectively it actually encourages the new reasoning which because connective tissue links they're going in a transmuscular, transarticular, or transskeletal level so you can put an umbrella of transanatomical thinking. So to summarize all this actually the simple idea, the simple divide that seems very natural once you embrace the logical inclusion of the connective tissue <coughs> into the picture. It's something that it's a call for thrifty approach to rehabilitation because if you think of the connective tissue contributions, connective tissue skeleton or connective tissue force transfer elements, they are by far the cheapest among the muscular skeletal structure. Just think about it. Connective tissue doesn't cost anything in terms of brain power processing. It doesn't cost much from the metabolic perspective. It doesn't cost much from the catabolic perspective. So the total focus is very straightforward. How we can engage that connective tissue framework, connective tissue honeycomb, connective tissue like force transferring mediums, to the greatest possible extent for the kids who are actually being very depleted in the department of the expensive and lavish structures such as the central nervous system and the muscular well, and the skeletal muscles, voluntary muscles and so on. So basically what we are going to talk about today is more or less to put some beef behind this to introduce some of the ba basic findings in the research that <coughs> backs up the idea that connective tissue is a viable and uh, justifiable and legitimate target of, of strengthening, legitimate target of addressing, and uh, then we'll run through some examples of how it works in real life. So just to get some encouragement and, uh, well, to put some practical perspective on it. So that's more or less the cover and the introduction, and uh, with this I will be passing on to the torch to Mark Driscoll, so my esteemed colleague who is very, very particular and have great attention to detail, but this is pretty much the main message of today's talk, that active role of connective tissue in movement, in movement and posture in cerebral palsy is important, and it if we find the ways to address it, it has a lot of potential benefits when specifically targeted via the right therapeutic needs. Right. 
So, <laughs> um, just a brief introduction about myself. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer who later specialized in biomedical engineering. And uh, what this means, it's just specifically for my thesis, I was involved in designing you know, implants, devices to correct spinal deformities. And I did a lot of research into musculoskeletal mechanics. So what this means is you do a lot of analysis on different postures, different movements, and the goal is to calculate how much forces are being distributed within the muscles and within the bones. And while I was doing that research, a lot of the time, I mean, even today, it's standard just to kind of pass aside the implications of connective tissues in any form of posture. And when we do the calculations, we, we say, you know, the assumption is to neglect the forces of connective tissue. And if we do include them into our calculations, we've always labeled them as passive and are kind of constants and don't really get implicated into the calculations themselves. So I, did, I started doing some research, and that's when I became implicated with Leonid, who he's kind of pointed towards this implication. And then, um, so what I'm going to talk to you a bit today is some of the studies that I found to be actually quite interesting. And um, in my opinion, who's, you know, over the last five years always neglected them, now I think it's, you know, you have to include them within your interpretations. And what makes it interesting, when you apply this to cerebral palsy, it becomes quite evident, and that's what Leonid will show later on during his assessment. So this will be in brief what I'll be talking about over the next uh, 40 minutes or so. And um, I titled it The Journey Towards Thrifty Rehab as Lena has the thrifty pun targeted towards uh, accessing connective tissue. So to begin, I'm just going to do a brief overview of what I perceive um, as an important understanding of the body of patients with cerebral palsy. So to begin, I mean, there's been a lot of different definitions of cerebral palsy, but basically if you look back to one of the original ones, so as you see here, cerebral palsy is titled as a persistent disorder, persistent but not unchanging disorder of movement and posture in the early years of life due to a non-progressive disorder of the brain. And this, I just wanted to emphasize this, it ties into what Leonid was addressing. I mean, essentially the brain injury is titled as non-progressive. Whereas we do know the musculoskeletal system can get worse, it can potentially get better. So that just, it gives hope for potential change. And um, when speaking of cerebral palsy, I think it's important to be aware of the, um, the GMFCS classification system. So this is the most universally accepted classification system and it's simple and easy to use and essentially classifies a patient with CP in five different groups. And what this study group, who's uh, from Hamilton in uh, Canada, did is they've, they've followed patients over 21 years, and they have, so on the y-axis here, it would be what would be their functional score, if you want. So you can consider a healthy person to score at 100. And then they classify these patients into different groups. So why this chart is very interesting, and I wanted to bring it up today, is it, it gives answers to a parent. So you know, common concerns of a parent with a CP child would be, you know, how bad is it? Will my child walk? How do we know if the therapy is working? So if we get back to this graph that I want to highlight, so you know, if the first time you assess your child, he'll fall into, say, um, GMCS type 4, you can basically be sure, and this is based on, as I said, 21 years follow-up, and it kind of gives us grim hope, but it's, it's essentially the reality of patients with CP. So you can't really expect someone from type 5 to jump from type 3 or type 4 to type 2 and so on. And this, as I said, it's the reality. And it also, it's, you know, it allows you to know where you are, where you sit with your child and what kind of gains can be expected if that is possible. So you may be asking, you know, why such grim expectations with these, with these charts? And the area I wanted to highlight, you know, for me, looking at this person who has incredible balance and flexibility, I look at that and I think, you know, there's no way I could do that. Even if I trained for five years, I doubt that I would be at this level. And then if you look at it from this, say, the spectrum of performance that I bring up here, you know, this person would be sitting, say, at the ultraviolet stage, which could be considered, you know, high performance of musculoskeletal 
abilities, if you want. And then, you know, it's, it's just to sit, you know, situate the uh, CP patients. They would be definitely within this lower range. And if, you know, you go back to those charts, they're definitely below standards in terms of ability to perform. So I guess I would put myself somewhere in the green region, if I might. And um, so looking at this, I say, you know, there's no way. So it's, it's important to keep that perspective that the CP child, even looking at the green, it's not possible. But that's not to say that it's not, you know, there is hope for performance and you can increase the ability of the child, to, you know, the ease at home, ease of care. And that, that's something that's always possible and that's something that, you know, today's methods aim to achieve. So this is something that my counterpart has added yesterday, and he says that, you know, current reality for parents with cerebral palsy children, he says, you know, stop, stop dreaming. Accept the grim reality and learn to cope with the curves, what he titled curves of doom. And uh, he says, you know, stop irresponsible dreaming or pipeline dreaming, chasing rainbows. You know, you're falling, and stop falling victim to dream merchants, because if, you know, a simple search of, CP rehabilitation therapy, there's a lot of people who show these amazing before and after pictures. They're trying, they're essentially dream merchants trying to sell a dream saying, come to us, we're going to fix this, this is our healing powers, and that's, that's not something that we're involved with. So however, what we can say is, you know, dream responsibly, and that, you know, build continuous incremental development advancements, and that's something that is possible within CP patients. So now that we understand that, I want to talk, and here when I speak about identifying weaknesses, this, I'm really going to enter into the aspect of connective tissue. And again, connective tissue has always been neglected of this passive element, but there's a lot of research showing it's important, and that's what I want to highlight next. So the way I look at it, there's, there could be considered four weaknesses, if you want to call them that. So four weaknesses in terms of referring to connective tissue. So the first, what we title it, is the mix of strong and weak. And, you know, it's the standard interpretation is that the strong always beats the weak. And this is true when you transfer this to connective tissue. So, again, something that I think is important to understand and was, you know, kind of important for me in the beginning is that People always think about, you know, people go to the gym, they're lifting weights, it's all about the muscle and the bones, so muscle transferring forces to the bones. But the reality is, if you take a cross-section of a muscle, it's basically infiltrated with connective tissue, and that you can actually see here. So this would be a cross-section of a, a muscle, they dried it up, and you have all the connective tissue that's acted here. And what happens within a muscle, you have these filaments sliding into each other, and that allows the motion to be transferred. But what's important to know is that what these filaments are actually gripping onto is the surrounding connective tissue. So if you have weak connective tissue, it's not, you know, the effort will be limited if you want, and that ties into the importance of all this hype about yoga and so forth. So that's important to acknowledge. And so what I say, you know, strong versus weak, how do we know patients with CP have strong versus weak connective tissues? There's a few studies that have looked into this, and one of, one of the ones here I wanted to highlight is this, this group. They actually put you know, healthy, pers healthy patients and CP patients in this seat, and if you want, they, they've knocked on, they put their leg forward and they knocked on to the front of their leg. And what they're trying to measure is they're trying to measure the actual stiffness or resistance of the connective tissue. And so they have an interesting method. So what they do is that they first eliminate the aspect of the reflex because they measure really, you know, sensitive measures of both reaction of the torque that the leg's resisting and against time. And I'm not going to go too much into the details, but essentially what they were able to show is that, you know, not only does, do we know that a spastic limb is resistance to that motion, but actually the connective tissue within the spastic limb is, you know, more rigid than those in a healthy patient. And this kind of shows, you know, there, there is some kind of remodeling that's happened within the connective tissue of a CP patient. So why is this important to note? If we look here that um, Lena and I did this short study that we did, um, it's a lot of computer modeling, so it has to do with my background. And essentially, without going into details, we placed a, um, 
simulated arm, if you want, in a push-up or press-up position. And we simulated both, you know, a patient having this offset of mechanical properties within a tissue against a healthy patient. And what we were able to show is that, you know, and it makes common sense that someone's going to favor the stronger tissues, you know, just whether it be intuitively or because of what we measured. But essentially the point is that if there are tissues within your body, if there's an imbalance of strength, the stronger one's going to absorb more of the load. And this is, this is commonly known within the med medical community. It's called stress shielding. And uh, again, you know, you may be asking you, you know, so what? what? Why does this matter? Well, if we look, if we get back to our spectrum of, say, um, physical performance, for healthy people, it's, I mean, it's not ideal, but it's okay because we're walking around. And if, say, you have one leg who's stronger than the other, you can go around. It's not uncommon that tennis players have a stronger arm than the other that they play with. It's not a big deal. But if for cerebral palsy, cerebral palsy patients, it's, it's not okay because they, they don't have the, the same stimulus. They're not up and about the same way that we are. So to elabor elaborate a bit more on this, the point I want to bring up is that within a CP child, if there's this unbalance of um, rigidities in connective tissue, it leads to what we call physiological stress shielding. And a way to think about this is if you take a flexible elastic in your hands and you, you play with it, you can stretch it. But if you take at the same time a flexible elastic and say a steel wire and you pull on it, you're not, the, the elastic's not going to be stretched. The steel wire is going to evolve, uh, kind of absorb all the forces. And this is an important concept to grasp because, you know, the health of all the tissues within our body, this is commonly understood, is you have to get stimulated. If you're bedridden for months, you're going to wake up weaker. You know, it's commonly known people who go to the gym versus couch potatoes. People who go to the gym have stronger bones, stronger tissues. So if some of these tissues are absorbing all the forces, shielding them, if you want, from the other ones, it leads to a problem because... For one, the stronger ones might get stronger. And what's more important, the weaker ones are going to be neglected. And so this is another paper that um, Lead and I wrote. And what we have here is commonly known, if you want to call it, the virtuous cycle. So this is what happens in everybody. So basically what you have is you have muscle action, stimulates tissue remodeling, it's sustainable, it's energy efficient, and it goes around like this because... We can continue with our daily lives. There's kind of this balance that allows you to, whether be more active or less, but essentially you're not going to get weaker, your tissue quality is not going to depreciate. But what happens if you flip this cycle, which what I was referring to um, earlier, and we titled it the vicious cycle, you can get into this you know, remodeling or this degenerative remodeling. And um, I said this is a common common aspect known to the medical community. And here we can see, so this is a um, child who's underwent a total hip arthroplasty. We can see here in the first image on the left that I'm referring to with the mouse. This is, say, post-operative, and this is two years or two or four, I forget. Anyhow, this is later on. And you can see that the bone surrounding the implant is kind of degrading, it's dissipating. And this has to do to the fact that the implant is more rigid than the bone. It's taking all the load. Surrounding bones being neglected, and it's getting weaker. So this happens both in the total hip arthroplasty and within the tissues that I was referring to earlier. And an interesting perspective of this is that, you know, the longer you're stuck in this process, the more you go down what we've kind of titled this, this ellipse that goes down, and it leads to a degenerative process. And... Um, so here to summarize this is levels of negative remodeling in cerebral palsy can be, lead to musculoskeletal deterioration. And, you know, this is not something that we're claiming as just having to do with cerebral palsy. There's been papers published with this for scoliosis, for tons of other deteriorating musculoskeletal disorders. And it's important to recognize that within a CP child, you know, again, focus simply on the connective tissue, try and ignore the aspect of just muscles and bones, that this does actually occur. So what would be the goal setting? Well, the goal setting of a cerebral palsy therapy would be if you want to reverse the cycle, right? We want to avoid extra depreciation of occurring, and we want to kind of put them back on the path of 
healthy tissue, if you want to call it. So the second limitation to a CP child in terms of connective tissue weakness that I see, I've titled it the lack of mechanical stimulation, and this ties into what I was just speaking about. So here, this gets me back to my example. It's, you know, illogical and unrealistic to think about someone who's bedridden to, to receive the same activity of someone who's active, right? And so this gets us back to our cerebral palsy patients. So I wrote here that irregular daily activity, that's without a doubt is equal to irregular stimulation, right? If you're not going to go out and do anything, well, your tissues aren't going to get regular stimulation. So the next topic is that tissues that are neglected will weaken, and that is undebatable and commonly understood. And this leads to what I've said, an unfavorable me metabolic state. And essentially what I mean by this is that you know, get back to the example of the bedridden or a couch potato, you know, not only are they going to be weaker, but definitely less healthy in other aspects that in their, of their health. And this is an important point that I want to bring up. The third point of weakness related to connective tissue, we can think about, you know, the irregular range of motion. And what's important here, again, is that I am simply referring to connect the tissue. So this, I'm not going to go too deep into this example. Leonid's going to talk about it a bit later, but essentially it ties into, you know, the commonly interpretation of range of motion. You can see here as you, know, you place the patient on their back, you move their legs to different degrees, and we assume that this is a true story of what's happening at the level of the hip. In reality, I mean, there's other players involved in this. And here you can see that this was an x-ray taken of a patient, you know, lying with his legs straight. You move the legs, say, to 60 degrees, and you can see a clear change within the spine. So what we're trying to tie in here and what this paper concluded is that range of motion is a function of flexibility. So this, it's not a real great revelation. It's what people would expect, but what's interesting is that when you apply this perspective to a child with CP, so commonly, you know, we test flexibility of a CP child and we assume the whole story has to do with either excessively tight hamstrings and we neglect that, you know, this flexibility has to do with not only just the flexibility at the hip, but there's other players involved. And as we've shown here, it's a clear player involved would be the flexibility within the local adjacent vertebrae or functional units within the spine. So, and so shown here, which is Leonid's going to talk about later, and he's going to demonstrate in his assessment. And um, so essentially the theory doesn't necessarily apply to the reality that's happening within a CP child. The fourth and final point of weakness within a connected tissue so here it's called poor weight bearing. And this, this is a really interesting concept. And I said at the beginning that, you know, I was commonly just interpreting musculoskeletal mechanics by looking at muscles and bones. And this, these studies that I'm going to talk about here is really what tied me in and got me involved into the implications of connective tissue. So here I'm just making a simple comparison of the classics, which is what I used when I did my calculations would be essentially just focusing on muscles and the skeleton. So you can see here the guy's remo removed his outer tissues, walking around as if he doesn't need it. But that is not necessarily the case. And we compare it to what Leonid's titled as trans-anatomical. So this basically includes all the classics and just adds this aspect of connective tissue. So before I start talking about this, I think it's important to recognize that you know, there, there are other types of skeletons. It's not, you don't necessarily need just bones and muscles to walk around. If you look within the animal, animal life, you can see that they have, there's animals that have what they call hydrostatic skeleton, so there's no bones. And it's, they're just, their compression resistance allows them to go about, so that would be either in worms, jellyfish, squid, whatever you want. And then the next one would be called an exoskeleton. So this would be in lobsters, crabs, grasshoppers. So this, again, there's no bones in, in these animals. Essentially, they have a rigid cell, shell, and the muscles link on to the rigid shell. So then it comes to us, what they call an endoskeleton. So I just wanted to bring this into perspective because, you know, 
there are other types of skeletons, and why do we think that humans simply, it's bones and muscles when you look in the animal kingdom, and there's different possibilities, right? So again, this brings us back to that question, is it classics, or are there more players involved? Can connective tissues actually have an influence on our balance, on our musculoskeletal performance? So here, this is, this is the first topic I wanted to highlight regarding uh, poor weight bearing. And this is what I've called the envelope in quality. So here we have the weightlifter. He's got the weight belt on. And it's commonly known that having a weight belt on will allow you to lift more weight and increases your, again, musculoskeletal performance. And uh, if we look, actually, you know, the mechanics behind a weight belt, what it's actually doing, it's increasing our intra-abdominal pressure. It's relieving some of that force on our spine, and it's allowing us to be more performant in that end. And if we go further, and if we look at what actual connective tissue does within our body, and again, connective tissue not only permeates through the muscles, as I described, but it wraps every organ, it separates organs, it's really, it's really quite integral, and it's interesting to look into. So what I've said here is that, you know, connective tissue is nature's weight belt, if you want. And, okay, so it's not just me saying this. There, there are actually studies that, there are many studies. I'm highlighting a few here. And this particular group who's um, from Australia, they wanted to look into the importance of this. So what they did, they've placed um, a pig on a table. They've sacrificed him, so he's no longer with us, doesn't feel any pain. And um, what they've done is they've, you know, to be brief, what they do is they press on the back of his spine, and they're measuring the displacement within his spine. And then they, so they do that, and they measure, so that, that would be their normal or their, their standard measure for comparison. And then what this particular surgeon does, he goes in and he, he slowly cuts away at these envelopes of connective tissue within the abdomen of the pig. And what was quite interesting was as soon as he made his first couple cuts of these tissues, you know, the resistance of the spine, it became much more flexible. So this, this just reaffirms what I was talking about when I was referring to it as nature's weight belt. You know, it really does have this envelope in quality, and there is an actual importance to this. And there are, there are further studies to support this. And so not only does it have an envelope in quality, but another way to look at it is connected tissue as a spatial quality. And um, so this, if you look within the spine... So if we focus on the intervertebral discs shown here. So where in the body is the most load? It's the spine, I can assure you that. It can support up to 10,000 pounds. And if you look, you know, how does it deal with these forces? Well, it's essentially the intervertebral discs, which is filled with this incompressible fluid. And when you press on it, it resists the expansion. And this, from a mechanical perspective, is a very very novel and, you know, interesting way to deal with this. And if you take that perception and you transfer it to what's actually happening within our abdomen, there's some truth to be told here. And, you know, a simple example, when I talk to people and I talk to my colleagues at uh, the research center, they kind of title me as being a little crazy sometimes when I overemphasize the importance of connective tissue. And I, I just use this simple example of, you know, commonly people, when they sit down, you know, they sit down as my colleague's doing here, and he's leaning forward. Why, why is he leaning forward, slouched like that? Because it's easy. It's the most energy-efficient position. And why is that? Because he's thrifty, if you want. <laughs> and so why is this? I mean, the muscles within his spines are kind of taking a holiday. They're not doing any kind of work. So what's actually holding him from falling over and hitting his head on his computer? It's, if you look at this picture, it's the actual, you know, it's the intra-abdominal pressure which is resisting to this compression. And this really gives an interesting spin, from my perspective anyhow, as an engineer who try and calculate what's actually happening. And, you know, conventionally this was completely neglected, but it does truly have an importance. And, again, I'm, I tried to avoid including a lot of studies within this presentation, but... This is another important one, and this is the same surgeon from Australia. And this is an interesting study, not only because he managed to convince people to take part in this. What he actually did, he put pressure transducers. So these are little electrical things that measure the amount of pressure. So he put some within their abdominal cavity. He, I think he placed some in, um, in a diaphragm and at different levels. 
They're he, still alive, right? Yeah, they are still alive. So, <laughs> and um, so he was just interested in when we do different activities within our life, such as jumping, picking things up. So he was interested in measuring what's happening within these cavities, and I excluded the um, the results for clarification for clarity, but. Essentially, you can take my word for it, any activity you do that demands extra balance, if you want, or extra musculoskeletal performance, you have an increase in these intra-abdominal layers within all these structures. And this, getting back to the seated slouched over position, it really emphasizes the importance that was previously neglected in terms of, you know, trying to understand what's happening within the musculoskeletal system. So, this is another study. This is, will be the last study I'm referring to. And this, again, this um, particular author, he used cadavers. So these um, people were already passed away. And what he did, he, he placed these fake balloons within their body. And it kind of refers to the pig study. But he was inflating these balloons with different pressure. And he was kind of looking into how, the ba how it changes the balance of the, um, the cadaver. And again, it just reaffirms this, the importance of this intra-abdominal pressure. So, so why am I talking about this? Well, if you look, you know, a simple look at this picture here is you look at, you know, a healthy patient. You, even if you press on them, they're not, there's going to be no collapse. And then if you look at a cerebral palsy patient, there's, there's something happening here. And Leonid will go into more perspective. But based on what I just said, it kind of ties in, you know, what's happening. That are these are the intra-abdominal pressures, you know, proper? Clearly not based on this picture. And again, Leonid will go into more examples. So to conclude this part, I think if you look at a normal patient just standing and then you look at a CP patient who can be compared to, say, an unstable Django block from my point of view, it, it's definitely not the same thing in terms of weight-bearing performance. So to summarize, you know, I've pointed out four weaknesses from my perspective, from my research. And they all point to the same thing. They point you know, to either weakened and neglective connective tissue. So next, you know, now that we know this, how do we find ways to strengthen these weakened and neglected tissues? Well, this ties again to Leonard's perspective. He titles it as being you know, a thrifty rehab process by actually trying to target these connective tissues. So the purpose would be to stimulate healthy remodeling within these neglected and weakened connected tissues. So okay, the obvious question is what, how, when, and where. So I'm going to try and go into this. So first, what am I talking about again t to touch base, get you on track, is that, so again, the health of all our tissues within our body depends on mechanical stimulus. This is undebatable, whether it be muscle performance, bone quality, even the way your bone grows grows can be manipulated based on local stresses. So, as I just showed you, cerebral palsy patients have weakened and neglected tissues. So the point would be to deliver stimulus or stress to these neglected tissues. And so again, what do I mean by this? How do we deliver stress? How do we, you know, reinstate um, health within these connected tissues? There are different ways you can make something change, make something remodel. And this is true, this, this extends to all the tissues within our body. If, say, someone who goes to the gym who does exercise, an Olympic athlete if you want, is when you go to the gym, if you really push yourself hard, what you're doing is you're basically causing little microtrauma, whether it be within your tissues, within your muscles, and then what happens is your body says, uh-oh, you know, why did this occur? I need to change, I need to get stronger. It sends the appropriate chemical guys, if you want, into action, and they lay down the foundation for whether it be stronger muscles, stronger bone, and so on. So this is one aspect, is pushing your body to microtrauma, and this is possible. And this is something that, you know, osteopaths can claim to, or myofascial release practitioners claim to. They claim to push the tissue into a microtrauma to try and stimulate remodeling. So to try and, you know, give the tissue a little wake up, if you want to call it, to make it get stronger. And another method that you can make tissue stronger without actually pushing it to microtrauma, and this would be 
it, it takes long and it's extremely slow, but if you push your tissue to really small deformations, and here I'd say, you know, within the range of one to two, which is quite small, but if you do that, say for an hour, the tissue, whether it gets annoyed with the process and wants to get stronger, but definitely it makes something happen locally within your tissue. And okay, so one to two deformation, this is extremely narrow, but you know, it's worth focusing on, and again, because it does avoid the microtrauma, and if we are, you know, trying to tailor this um, therapy to CP people, you want to avoid microtrauma. So, you know, I'm, I'm not taking this from the clouds. There are studies that support this, so, you know, one to two deformation may seem extremely small, but within the literature, the scientific literature, it's what they call a repetitive motion strain, so it's just you know, consistently just playing with the tissue if you want until something happens. So these experimentations have been done in a, a petri dish. So what they did, they've taken the cells from these connected tissues, put them in a dish, and just strained them, whether it be with liquid or stretching them mechanically. But what they've shown is, you know, simply after this particular experiment was done for a day, but they did see changes within after an hour. And you know, although it might be hard to see, you know, what are we looking at here? Are these fish? They're actually little fibroblasts within the tissue. And the longer you strain them, even if it's just simply one to two percent, is actually it encourages the proliferation of these cells. So in other words, it encourages these cells to wake up to say, okay, we need to change what's happening. We need to get stronger. So again, just to summarize this point is if you deliver, deliver the stimulus to tissues, they will get stronger. And again, so how do we deliver the stress to this tissues? Well, this is something that's uh, adopted within uh, Leonid's therapy, which is titled ABR therapy, which we haven't mentioned until now, but essentially if, if there is an avenue to strengthen these tissues, and if these tissues are weak within a CP child, well, this can either be done manually or automatic, and this will be something that we can talk about later if we want to go into details. So when and where, and this is a key, this is a key point, an interesting point, you know. <clears throat> many hours are required to achieve this. I said it's, it's, it's a small deformation, one to two, and if you want to make a difference, it has to be persistent. It has to be even daily at that to actually get a tangible change. And so this is not possible via the conventional rehabilitation approach. And what I mean by this is in a hospital setting, visiting as often as you can. It's, for the family with a CP child, it's, it's difficult. And so the topic of our, or the title of our presentation was, you know, home-based or family-centered therapy. Well, if this is a true avenue to strengthen these weakened tissues, it would be unfeasible both, you know, based on the cost and the time from the parents to actually try and install this within a hospital setting. So what I write here is this would be only feasible via home-based or family-centered care. And this is something we'll talk about more in detail later. So finally, okay, this is something that within Leonid's um, practice has been going on for the last couple of years. I've been on board as a researcher, I think, for, for three. And a lot of the beginning implicated, you know, the research that I presented today, what's happening. And then recently, last year, we adopted what we call, it's, um, it's a two-year prospective cohort study. And what we're doing is we have over 200 CP patients, and we're trying to measure whether a change is happening. And this is taking place both within the United States and South America. And so there's four avenues that we're exploring. So one is we're looking into those GMFM scores to see if there's a difference over time. And these GMFM scores are just functional tests of the child to try and score them against their, their rating. Next, we're looking into the CP child questionnaire, and you know, sadly, there's not a lot of results for this study because it has only been going on for six months. The, the one study that has been going on for uh, a year would be the CP child questionnaire. So here, I write interesting trends, but to date, insufficient data. So for me, being you know, a scientist, I really, I can't bring myself to talk about results unless there's real tangible support behind it, and it's statistically significant, so I'm going to avoid going into detail. But what actually I can talk about, it was within the CP child questionnaire, and this is a questionnaire that's given to parents 
who have a CP child. It's been developed by the same group who do the GMFM classification. It's been validated, tons of studies have used this, and essentially qualifies the um, quality of life and the general health and well-being of a CP child. And what's interesting for us is, you know, if we followed our patients who had a GMFM type 4, which is along the severe area, we saw an improvement by 3 points after 6 months and 10 points after 12 months. So it's difficult to place this in pers into perspective, but these are, you know, both statistically significant and clinically significant in the sense that parents have seen improvement that are encouraging. And not only do we see this improvement in our type 4 patients, but also in our type 5 patients. And this was really encouraging results for us. And we're, you know, although they're preliminary, they are significant enough to talk about. And we'll be presenting this at the American Academy of Cerebral Policy in Las Vegas in October. And we're very thrilled about this. So, you know, after I've hit you with all this theory, I just want to get back to my conclusion to put it back in perspective. And again, the whole point that I want to bring across, and hopefully I was able to convince you, is that connective tissue, they do have an active role in posture and movement. This active role is important. It was previously neglected. And when applied for cerebral palsy, there's a lot of potential for benefits if they're specifically targeted via an appropriate therapy. So with that, I'll give you back to Leonid, and he'll go a little more into detail.